Hello everyone, I'm Brett Champion, Superintendent of Schools in the Medford School District, and I get the great joy today of reading another Andrew Clements book. We read Frindle last time. You can catch that um, on our YouTube channel. Um, and today, though, I'm going to be reading one of his books called No Talking, set in the fifth grade, and we're going to get rolling. Chapter one, zipped. Dave Packer was in the middle of his fourth hour of not talking. He was also in the middle of his social studies class on a Monday morning in the middle of November, and Laketon Elementary School was in the middle of a medium-sized town in the middle of New Jersey. There was a reason Dave was in the middle of his fourth hour of not talking, but this isn't the time to tell about that. This is the time to tell what he figured out in the middle of his social studies class. Dave figured out that not talking is extra hard at school, and the reason? Teachers. Because at 11.35, Mrs. Overby clapped her hands and said, Class, class, quiet down. Then she looked at her list and said, Dave and Lindsay, you're next. So Dave nodded at Lindsay and stood up. It was time to present the report about India. But giving this report would ruin his experiment because Dave was trying to keep his mouth shut all day. He wanted to keep his lips zipped right up to the very end of the day to not say one single word until the last bell rang at 10 after 3. And the reason Dave had decided to clam up, but it still isn't the time to tell about that. This is the time to tell what he did about the report. Dave and Lindsay walked to the front of the room. Dave was supposed to begin the presentation by telling about the history of India. He looked down at his index cards, looked up at Mrs. Overby, looked out at the class, and he opened his mouth. But he didn't talk. He coughed. Dave coughed for about 10 seconds. Then he wiped his mouth, looked at his index cards again, looked at Mrs. Overby again, looked at the class again, opened his mouth again, and coughed some more. He coughed and coughed and coughed until his face was bright red and he was all bent over. Lindsay stood there feeling helpless. Dave hadn't told her about his experiment, so all she could do was watch and listen to his horrible coughing. Lindsay's opinion of Dave had never been high, and it sank lower by the second. Mrs. Overby thought she knew what was happening with Dave. She had seen this before, kids who got so nervous that they made themselves sick rather than talk in front of the class. It surprised her because Dave wasn't shy at all, ever. In fact, none of this year's fifth graders were the least bit shy or nervous about talking, ever. But the teacher took pity and said, you'd better go get some water. You two can give your report later. Lindsay gave Dave a disgusted look and went back to her desk. Dave nodded at Mrs. Overby, coughed a few more times for good measure, and hurried out of the room. And with Dave out in the hall getting a drink, it's the perfect time to tell why he was in the middle of his fourth hour of not talking and why he had decided to keep quiet in the first place. Chapter 2, Gandhi. When something happens, there's usually a simple explanation, but what simple? But, but that simple explanation is almost never the full story. Here's the simple explanation anyway. Dave had decided to stop talking for a whole day because of something he'd read in a book. See? Very simple, very clear. But it's not the whole story. So here's a little more. Dave and a partner had to prepare a report on India. Not a long one, just some basic facts. Something about the history, something about the government, something about the land and the industry, something about the Indian people and their culture, five minutes or less. Dave's report partner was Lindsay Burgess, and neither one of them was happy about that. There were some boy-girl problems at Laketon Elementary School, but this isn't the time to tell about that. Even though Dave and Lindsay had to give their report together, they both agreed they did not want to prepare it together. So they decided the topics, so they divided the topics in half and each worked alone. Dave was a good student, and he had found two books about India, and he had checked them out of the library. He hadn't read both books, not completely. He wasn't that good a student, but he had read parts of both books. Dave thought the most interesting section in each book was the part about how India became independent, how the country broke away from England to become a free nation, sort of like the United States did. And Dave thought the most interesting person in the story of India's independence was Mahatma Gandhi. Dave was amazed by Gandhi. This one skinny little man practically pushed the whole British army out of India all by himself. But he didn't use weapons or violence. He fought with words and ideas. It was an incredible story, all of it true. And in one of the books, Dave read this about Gandhi. For many years, one day each week, Gandhi did not speak at all. Gandhi believed that this was a way to bring order to his mind. Dave read that bit of information on Thursday afternoon, and he read it again on Sunday night as he prepared for his oral report. And it made him wonder what that would be like to go a whole day without saying a single word. And Dave began to wonder if not talking would bring order to his mind, too. In fact, Dave wondered what that meant to bring order to his mind. Could something as simple as not talking change the way your mind worked? Seemed like it must have been good for Gandhi. 
But what would it do for a regular kid in New Jersey? Would not talking make him smarter? Would he finally understand fractions? If he had more order in his mind, would he be able to look at a sentence and see which word was an adverb instead of just guessing? And how about sports? Would someone with a more orderly mind be a better baseball player? Powerful questions. So Dave decided to zip his lip and give it a try. Was it hard for him to keep quiet? You bet, especially at first, like when he got to the bus stop where his friends were arguing about why the Jets had lost to the Patriots. But Dave had learned quickly that by nodding and smiling, by frowning and shrugging, by shaking his head, by giving a thumbs up or a high five, or even by just putting his hands in his coat pockets and turning away, not talking was possible. And by the time he had ridden the bus to school, Dave had gotten pretty good at fitting in without speaking up. There. That explains what's going on a little better. And it's probably enough, at least for the moment, but there's more. There's always more. And now we're back in class on Monday with Dave, who got through the rest of social studies without saying a word. And when the bell rang at the end of the period, it was time for fifth grade lunch. More than 125 kids began hurrying toward the cafeteria, and by the time they got there, the fifth graders were already talking like crazy, all except one. Chapter 3, Insults. If you had to shut up for five minutes, I bet the whole top of your head would explode. As those words flew out of his mouth, Dave had two thoughts. First, he thought, darn it, because he remembered he'd been trying not to talk at all. And his second thought was, Gandhi probably wouldn't have said that, because it wasn't a very nice thing to say. But that's what Dave said, and he said it to Lindsay Burgess, and there was a reason he said it. So it's time to back up a little and explain. Dave had gotten through the lunch line without a peep. He had pointed at the pizza plate, then pointed at the fruit cup. He had nodded for yes, please, and shook his head for no thanks. He had grabbed some milk from the cooler and flashed his lunch pass at Mrs. Vitelli, and he had smiled a lot. No talking, no problem. Then he had sat down at a table with some of his friends, just like always, but instead of jumping into the conversation, David kept a pleasant look on his face and had kept his mouth full of food. No talking, no problem. And because he wasn't talking, Dave had focused all his energy on listening. Listening at the lunch table, really listening, was a brand new experience for him. Because most of the time, Dave was a loudmouth. See, there's something more about Dave. And it makes Dave's reaction to Gandhi make more sense. Because if Dave himself was a loudmouth, a real tongue flapper, then someone like Gandhi, who could keep completely quiet, would seem that much more amazing. Because Dave really did love to talk. He could talk and talk and talk about almost anything. Baseballs, cards. Cars, dinosaurs, rock hunting, soccer, snowboarding, water skiing, favorite books, best football player, camping, canoeing, PlayStation, Nintendo, Xbox, comic books, TV shows, movies, you name it. Dave had a long, long list of interests, and he had plenty of opinions. Plus, talking always made Dave feel like he was in charge. It was sort of like being a police officer out in the middle of traffic. As long as he did the talking, the traffic went the way he wanted it to. This was especially useful if insults started flying around. When it came to dishing out the put-downs, Dave was a pro. But this lunchtime, all the other loudmouths were getting a chance to spout off, so Dave had chewed his pizza and sipped his milk and listened. And after a minute or two, he began listening to Lindsay Burgess, but only because he couldn't help it. Even though she was sitting behind him at the next table, and even though the cafeteria was almost bursting with noise, Lindsay had a sharp voice, the kind that cuts like a hacksaw. So I said, are you serious? And she said, what's wrong with you? And I said, because I saw it first, and I did, and it was a great color for me because my hair is brown and her hair's that mousy blonde color, but her mom was right there in the store, so she picked it up and took it over to her, and her mom bought it. Can you believe that? She knew I wanted that sweater more than anything, and she bought it anyway, and then, after school on Friday at soccer practice, she smiled at me like she wanted to be friends or something, as if, can you believe that? Nope. Dave couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that anyone could flap and yap her mouth so fast and say so many words and be so boring and stupid sounding all at the same time. He took another bite of pizza and tried to stop listening, but Lindsay was just getting warmed up because then she comes over after practice and she says, here, this is for you, and she tries to give me the sweater, so I pull my hands away like she's holding a dead skunk or something, and I say, you think I want that? That thing is so ugly. I would never wear that, and she says, oh, just like that, just oh, and she walks away with the sweater, except now I wish I hadn't said that because it really is the best color, and it's really soft by this point. Dave was wishing he had an iPod because if he had one, 
And if it hadn't been against school rules, he could have plugged up both his ears and cranked the volume, anything to get away from the sound of Lindsay's voice. Because once I tried wearing this sweater that was made of wool, and it made my neck itch so much, like I couldn't even wear it for two minutes. But it was okay, because then my mom found this turtleneck way down in the bottom of my dresser, and I'd forgotten I even had it, and it was pink. So then I put that on first, and then the sweater was fine, because really, it was like the two colors went together perfectly, almost like a picture in a magazine. Because last week, in Teen People, Jenna and Lori and Keith were at this party like in Hollywood or somewhere and Jenna had on a sweater that was almost like that wool one I have and she was wearing these and that was the moment when Dave completely forgot about keeping silent and he turned around and almost shouted if you had to shut up for five minutes I bet the whole top of your head would explode and Dave was glad he'd said it even if it wasn't nice and even though it ended his experiment because after he said it Lindsay stopped talking but the quiet only lasted about three seconds Lindsay said is your cough all better? Because I thought I just heard a whiny little voice. She and her friends stared at Dave. Did you say something? Yeah, I did, he said. I said, I bet if you had to shut up for five minutes, the top of your head would explode like a volcano from all the hot gas that usually comes out of your mouth when you talk and talk and talk and never stop talking. Yeah, that's what I said to you. Lindsay tilted her head and looked at Dave, sort of the way a bird looks at a bug is about to eat. Oh, like there's something wrong with talking? You never have any trouble with yourself blabbing and blabbing every day. We've all heard you. And the other girls nodded and made faces. Well, Dave said, talking's okay when there's stuff worth saying. Lindsay said, oh, so boys can say anything like, hey, did you hear this guy got traded to that team and that guy got traded to this team and hey, he hit real good last year and ooh, yeah, he can really catch. Boys can talk and talk like that, but girls can't talk about clothes sometimes. Is that it? Dave said, no, but... I don't talk the way you talk, like for a million minutes in a row without stopping, and, and they was hunting for something strong to say, a real punchline, something that would shut Lindsay up and end this conversation. So he said, and anyway, boys never talk as much as girls do, ever. Please take a careful look at that last thing Dave just said, because with this particular group of fifth graders, that was a dangerous thing to say. And now is a good time to tell a little more about the fifth grade boys and fifth grade girls at Laketon Elementary School to explain why it was a bad idea for Dave to say what he just said. Because Dave should have kept his mouth shut. He really should have. Chapter 4, Cooties. When little Dave Packer and all the other kids his age first showed up to begin kindergarten together, it was, a sort, of, it was sort of like they were new recruits joining the Army. And kindergarten was sort of like basic training camp, except the teachers were a lot nicer than Army drill instructors. After nine long months together in kindergarten, Dave and the other new recruits were allowed to quit the Army, but only for the summer, because in September they all had to re-enlist for first grade. And after first grade, they marched through second grade together, then third, and so on, right through the grades, together. A few kids moved away, and a couple of new kids arrived, but Dave and those original kindergarten recruits stayed together year after year, and they began to grow up together. At most elementary schools, by the time a group gets to fifth grade, the boys have stopped thinking of that all the girls have cooties, and the girls have stopped thinking that all the boys have cooties, and that's the way it should be, to outgrow that stuff. For some groups, it's easy. The kids grow up a little bit, and they all learn that everyone's a real person, and some of those persons are boys, and some are girls, and suddenly everyone gets along just fine, person to person, no more cooties. However, some groups of kids cling to those cooties a little too long. The boys avoid the girls, and the girls avoid the boys, and everyone keeps seeing cooties everywhere. And sadly, that's the way it was with most of the fifth grade kids at Laketon Elementary School. Of course, the fifth graders didn't actually use the word cooties anymore. That would have sounded like baby talk. They used words like dumb or gross or immature or annoying. But a cootie, by any other name, is still a cootie. And even worse, Dave and Lindsay were the king and queen of the fifth grade cootie clingers. Dave had zero tolerance for girls, and Lindsay had less than zero tolerance for boys. And that's why Dave should have kept his mouth shut. Now it's time to get back to the action in the lunchroom, because Lindsay heard, when Lindsay heard Dave say boys never talk as much as girls do, she felt like all girls everywhere had been insulted, slapped in the face by a dumb, gross, immature, annoying boy, and she hadn't forgotten what Dave had already said about the top of her head blowing off because of hot gas. Lindsay wasn't the kind of person who forgives and forgets an insult. She was the kind of person who remembers and then gets even. Chapter 5, The Contest. Lindsay narrowed her eyes and hissed, You take that back. Dave shrugged. Take what back? That girls are big blabberheads all the time? No way, because they are. Everybody knows it. It's a shame to have to report this, but Dave actually believed what he was saying. 
and in his ignorant but creative young mind, an idea sparked to life. Before Lindsay or any of her friends could say something back, Dave said, and there's a way to prove that girls talk way more than boys, unless you're afraid of some competition, you and your noisy friends. Afraid? Lindsay said, looking around at the girls. We're not afraid of anything, except catching whatever made you so stupid. The girls giggled, but Dave ignored the insult, completely caught up by his new idea. He waved his hands to quiet them down. Okay, okay, here's the deal. A whole day of no talking at school. Not in class, not in the halls, not on the playground, nowhere. No talking at all. And it's a contest. Boys against girls. Whichever side talks less, wins. Lindsay made a face. No talking at school? That's impossible. Dave had an advantage here. He had just spent almost four hours without saying a word at school. So he had some experience, and he felt like he knew what he was talking about. He grinned and said, maybe it's impossible for a girl to be quiet, but I bet the boys can do it, or at least we can do it better than the girls. Lindsay said, but like, what if a teacher looked right at you and asked a question? Then what? Dave grinned and said, you could always cough. Lindsay's mouth dropped open. Then she glared at him. You did that coughing in social studies on purpose? You are so immature, Dave shrugged. It was sort of a test, and it worked. But if every kid in fifth grade coughed every time a teacher asked a question, that would not work. Lindsay sniffed. Well, I say this whole idea is childish, silly and childish. It's okay if you don't want to, Dave said. It was just an idea. I mean, I can see why you'd be afraid since you're a girl and all. And since you have to talk every other second, no problem. Sorry I interrupted you. Just keep talking to your friends there. You were talking about something important, weren't you? That special sweater, right? Go ahead, talk. You girls go on and talk and talk and talk all you want to. Lindsay pressed her lips together and glared at Dave. Her eyes narrowed to slits. You are the most annoying little... She stopped mid-insult and folded her arms. All right, she said. Let's work out the rules right now. If a teacher talks to you, what then? Your answer, Dave said. How many words can you use, she asked. Dave smiled. Let's make it ten words in case you and your friends need to tell a teacher about some new clothes you got. Stop trying to be funny because you're not, Lindsay said. Make the limit four words. If you answer with more than four words in a row, the extras count. Dave shook his head. Four still too easy. Let's make it a three-word limit, and every illegal word is one point against your team. Duh, said Lindsay, like I needed you to explain that. So it's a three-word limit? Dave said. Three, said Lindsay. And you can answer teachers or the principal or any grown-up at school, said Dave, like the custodian. Or the nurse, added Lindsay, because she wasn't about to let Dave Packer have the last word about anything. What about contractions, she asked. What about them, Dave said. Does a contraction count as one word or two? Dave didn't let it show in his face, but he was impressed by Lindsay's question, that she was able to think so far ahead and figure out that words like won't or isn't could, can't, could cause a scorekeeping problem. And right away, Dave was just as impressed with himself because he understood how to answer her question with a question of his own. He said, if you go find a dictionary, can you look up the word won't? Lindsay nodded. Of course you can. Then it's a word, one word, said Dave. Any other questions? And now it was Lindsay's turn to hide her thoughts because she was impressed with Dave's answer. He was still very annoying, but his answer seemed right. Plus, he'd explained his reasoning clearly, but she didn't get carried away with good feelings about Dave. He was still a miserable, unpleasant boy who was forcing her to get involved in a pointless contest. It's also a shame to have to report this, but Lindsay was just as proud and stubborn as Dave. And since he had pushed her into this fight, she felt it was her duty to push back, and she saw the perfect way to do it. She turned away and whispered something to the girls at her lunch table, and when they all nodded their heads, she turned back to Dave. She gestured toward her friends and said, We want to make this contest harder. How about this? No talking at home, either, or on the school bus or anywhere else. No talking at all, except for what we already decided. Not even to parents. And let's make the contest last for two days instead of one. Two 24-hour days in a row, unless you think that's too hard. Dave shrugged. Fine, no problem. Except, how do we keep track of all the mess-ups when you and your friends start gabbing at home? You mean when the boys cheat, said Lindsay. Simple. We'll have to use the honor system when we're not at school. It's the only way. We all keep track of our own mistakes and report them, honestly. Except I don't know if the boys can be trusted. Have any boys ever heard of the honor system? I know you can trust the girls. Don't worry about us, Dave said. Lindsay tossed her head. So when does the contest start? 
The girls can be ready by tomorrow at lunchtime, unless that's too soon for the boys. Do you need more time to get organized, like a week or two weeks? Very funny, said Dave. We'll start Tuesday, tomorrow, at the beginning of lunch, and it's not over until Thursday. How about at 12.15? That'll be the middle of lunch period. Lindsay nodded, and Dave went on. I'll be the official scorekeeper for our side, and you keep track for the girls, and no cheating, okay? Lindsay nodded again. Agreed. She held out her hand. Dave looked at it like it was covered with slime. What? He said. Lindsay wrinkled her nose. It's revolting. We have to shake on it, so you won't try to back out. Dave shook, then made a show of wiping his hand on his pants, which got a big laugh from the five or six other boys who had witnessed the ceremony. And as Dave turned and went into a huddle with the guys at his lunch table, Lindsay did the same with the girls at her table. The contest was on. Chapter 6, Teamwork. The boys Dave ate lunch with were his best friends. He looked around at them and grinned after he'd explained the rules. Cool contest, huh? Todd shook his head. I'm not doing this. It's dumb. Who wants to not talk? Besides, it's impossible, like she said. You think girls can stop talking and boys can't? Dave asked. So you're just giving up without a fight? Is that it? Todd said, well, no, but it's still a stupid idea. So what, said Dave. It's a contest, and the boys are going to win it, okay? So listen, first, we've got to tell every guy. Everybody has to be with us on this. Tim Flanagan was absent in the homeroom this morning. I'll call him in case he's coming back tomorrow. And you all have to do that too. Figure out who else isn't here. And if you don't have a number, call me at home tonight because my mom has a school directory. And every fifth grade boy who's here at school has to be told today, okay? Jason said, but really, not talking for two days? Like how? Dave pulled an index card from his pocket. On the back of his India report, he wrote the word easy. He held it up showing it to all the boys. Then he said, did I just talk? No, said Jason. Dave said, keep watching. He shook his head. Then he nodded at them. Then he smiled. Then he frowned and showed his teeth and growled like a dog. I didn't talk, right? But you got what I said. Not talking just means not talking. It'll probably be fun, but even if it's not, it's a contest against the girls and we're going to win it, okay? Right? And tell all the guys to practice short sentences, three words or less. Jim said, you bug me. Jason said, your breath stinks. Richard said, look, it's Batman. Hey, is Batman one word or two? And the sentences kept coming, each boy trying to be the goofiest. Guys, Dave said, guys, come on. We've only got 14 minutes before next period. All the fifth grade boys are right here at lunch. It's the perfect chance to tell everyone. And I hate to tell you, but the girls are already ahead of us. The boys hushed and looked around. Lindsay, Anna, Emily, Taryn, all the friends who'd been sitting at the next table were fanning out through the cafeteria, talking to every girl in sight, and Hannah and Karen were heading for the door to the playground. Dave said, everybody know what you have to say to our team? The boys looked back at him and nodded, each face deadly serious now. All right then, Dave said, let's do this. Chapter 7, The Unshushables. Since Dave and Lindsay had been almost shouting at each other in the middle of the cafeteria, you might think that a lot of the other fifth graders in the room would have turned, tuned in and paid attention to the commotion. You might think that a lot of kids in the lunchroom already knew about the contest, but if you thought that, you'd be wrong. And you'd be wrong because you don't understand just how loud, how incredibly noisy it was in the cafeteria during fifth grade lunch. And not just on this one day. It was noisy during fifth grade lunch every day, and it wasn't noisy only at lunch. Anywhere a bunch of these fifth graders got together, the talking got out of hand. That's why it's time to tell a little more about this particular set of fifth grade kids, because there's more to tell. There's always more. A school system really is a little like the Army. Remember about how kindergarten is sort of like basic training camp? Because kindergarten was where Dave and the other new recruits first learned the rules. They learned when to sit and when to stand, when to talk and when to hush, when to, hawk and to walk and when to run, when to eat and nap and play and sing and draw and everything else. Because every system needs rules. No rules, no system. Most of the rules made perfect sense to Dave and the new recruits, especially rules like this. No fighting, no bullying, no shoving, no spitting, no biting, no stealing, no vandalism, no cutting in line, no snowball throwing, and so on. For most kids, the really serious rules like that weren't hard at all. Those were the easy ones. The toughest rules were ones like no running in the halls, hard. No disorderly behavior in the buses, also hard. No candy or chewing gum, very hard. But nowhere in the 44-page Laketon Elementary School handbook did it actually say no whispering, chatting, talking, calling out, yelling, or shouting in classrooms, in the hallways, in the auditorium, or in the lunchroom. 
True, there was a rule about paying attention in class, and there was a rule about being respectful, and there was a rule about being courteous at all times. And David and his classmates obeyed those rules, or at least they thought they did. It's just that they all seemed to think that they could talk and be courteous at the same time. And they all seemed to think they could talk and pay attention at the same time. Because none of those kids really meant to be disrespectful or disobedient or discourteous, but none of them wanted to stop talking, ever. In fact, this group of kids had been given a nickname by the teachers at Lakedon Elementary School, and the name had stuck with them ever since they had all been in first grade together. They were the Unshushables. If Lakedon Elementary School had really been like the Army, then sometime, probably during second grade, Dave and Lindsay and all the other recruits would have been lined up out on the playground on a cold, rainy morning, and a gruff man with short hair and shiny shoes would have walked up and down in front of them, shouting right into their faces, and he would have shouted something like this, You drive me crazy! You call yourselves students? You're a miserable mob! You're loud, undisciplined, and I will not tolerate your noise! When you walk in my hallways, you do not shout! You do not wave and yell and hoot when you see your friends at any assembly in my school! You do not whisper and giggle and point and wave and, and laugh at your own silly jokes! And when you come to my lunch Room. It is not a free-for-all festival of flap-jawed jibber-jabber. Lunch is a time to sit and be quiet and eat. I'm going to teach you little motor-mouth monsters proper school manners. If it is the last thing I do, do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Quieter. Yes, sir. But of course, Lakedon Elementary School wasn't the army. However, when Mrs. Abigail Hyatt, with, with Mrs. Abigail Hyatt in charge, sometimes it felt that way. She was a tall woman with a long face, curly gray hair, and bright blue eyes, and she had been the principal at Lakedon Elementary School for the past 13 years. She gave careful orders, set precise goals, and she demanded results from her teachers, from her office staff, from her custodians, from her cafeteria workers, and from her students and their parents, too. Her school never went over its budget, never missed its academic targets, and the place never felt loose or sloppy or disorderly. Under Mrs. Hyatt's watchful eye, group after group of children had wandered into Lakedon Elementary School as aimless little kindergartners and marched out six years later as perfectly disciplined young students. Under Mrs. Hyatt's leadership, the place ran like clockwork. And then the unshushables came along. In all her years as principal, she had never known a group of kids like this. And for the past five years, Mrs. Hyatt had been trying to make those kids obey the simplest school rule of all, no talking except when it's allowed. Year after year, memos had been sent home to the parents of Dave and his classmates about too much shouting on the school buses. Year after year, Dave's grade had been told how to behave before every assembly. Year after year, all their teachers had stood out in the hallways to try to keep the noise down before and after school and especially at lunchtime. This group had even been given a separate lunch period for the past three years in a row, third grade lunch, fourth grade lunch, and this year, fifth grade lunch. Mrs. Hyatt had made this decision. She didn't want the noisy behavior of this group to infect the other children at her school. Because year after year, the Unshushables lived up to their nickname. To be honest, a few of this year's fifth grade, fifth grade teachers had already given up. They didn't have any real hope of changing these kids. They were just trying to cope. Because it was already November, so in six short months, the Unshushables would be gone forever, moved along to the junior high, and next year, Lakedon Elementary School would be quieter, much quieter. But Mrs. Hyatt had not given up, not by a long shot. She still had over half a year with these kids, and she intended to use that time. Every day, the principal stalked the fifth grade hall. You there, stop shouting. At every assembly, she glared, and I don't want to hear even a whisper from our fifth graders. Is that clear? At every fifth grade lunch, she walked around the cafeteria with a big red plastic bullhorn, and when the noise became unbearable, she pulled the trigger and bellowed, Students, you are talking too loud. Mrs. Hyatt felt sure that this constant reminding had to be having an effect on these kids. How could it not? After all, these were good kids, right? They had to be making progress, didn't they? She knew she was being very stern with them, but it was for their own good. And Mrs. Hyatt felt sure that sooner or later, these kids would grow up a little and quiet down a lot. And now it's time to tell what happened in the middle of the second Tuesday in November during Dave Packer's final year at Lakedon Elementary School. It was two minutes before fifth grade lunch and the principal was ready, just like always. Mrs. Hyatt had checked to be sure that the other teacher who had fifth grade lunch duty wasn't out sick or at a meeting because it wasn't good to try to manage fifth grade lunch all by yourself. And just like always, she had ordered Mr. Lipton, the custodian, to stay in the cafeteria today until 1240 because with this group, the more grown-ups around, the better. And Mrs. Hyatt had double-checked the batteries in her red plastic bullhorn because it wasn't good to have a dead bullhorn during fifth grade lunch. 
Then the bell rang, and as classroom doors along the fifth grade hall flew open, Mrs. Hyatt could hear them coming, all of them, already calling to each other as locker doors clanged open and banged shut, already talking a mile a minute, already laughing and whooping and shouting, streaming down the hallway toward the cafeteria, an unshushable wave of energy and excitement and noise, so much noise. Mrs. Hyatt took her position at the center of the cafeteria and braced herself. She was ready for today's lunchroom battle, ready to change chaos into order, ready for anything these kids could dish out. Out, but nothing could have prepared her for what happened next. We'll pick up where we left off tomorrow. See you then.